I'm Natalie Tisdall, a journalist who decided enough is enough. I left a career that looked glamorous to do what I was scared of doing, going out on my own. I'm a married working mom of three. On this podcast, we're going to talk about issues that really matter. Why am I not sleeping? What's up with that diet everyone's talking about? Are my kids falling behind? How do I leave that job and start over? Welcome to the Natalie Tisdall Podcast. I'm so glad you're here. Hi, everyone. It's Natalie. I hope your summer has been as relaxing and fun as mine, and maybe even more so. Today, I have a special guest who's dedicated to empowering women and revolutionizing their health journey. Joining me is Dr. Stephanie Young Moss, a passionate pharmacist with a wealth of knowledge on women's health and an advocate for embracing life beyond menopause. Dr. Stephanie received her Doctor of Pharmacy degree from Xavier University of Louisiana College of Pharmacy and a Master's of Health Services Administration with a concentration in health economics from the University of Wyoming. She's not a traditional pharmacist though. For 20 years, she's been focused on managed care, health economics, and outcomes research, and also health equity. Menopause, you know, that's a word that often evokes apprehension and uncertainty. But Dr. Stephanie is here to challenge those perceptions. We're going to delve into the transformative power of menopause and the beginning stages called perimenopause. And if you're like me for many years, maybe you've been thinking, that's not me. I'm so young. But think again, because perimenopause can actually start in your 30s. Would you know if those symptoms started? I'd love for you to just take a minute to check out my website. It's natalietisdall.com. And if you hear anything that you want more information on in this podcast, be sure to go to the show notes for links. Let's get started today with Dr. Stephanie. Dr. Stephanie, I know you're a pharmacist. You're passionate about health and especially about helping women. So let's get right into that dreaded word, menopause. (laughs) Well, I don't want people to feel as though it can be a dread or a drag. And that's really part of my mission is to let women know that life does not end with their period and that you still can live a colorful, wonderful life after that. So that's one of my main things is because we have been taught, right, that it's Um, dreadful and don't get me wrong some of the symptoms can be you know pretty bad for some people but I just want to make sure people are able to know that it's also a great thing because you're still alive too right so well that's made it to menopause you know what glass (laughs) half full here okay because you made it to menopause and there are I mean obviously we don't have to deal with the periods any longer once we get there so that's a bonus if we're looking at the glass half full (laughs) but I think for a lot of women it's it's everything leading up to it and the unknown. Mm -hmm. So, you know, maybe the periods get less frequent or for some people um, it's weight gain or Mm -hmm. hot flashes, Mm -hmm. but let's, Mm -hmm. let's kind of draw back because if women are like me, you're like, ah, that's a long way down the road. That's going to happen so far. And then as these little things start to happen, like the weight gain or the Mm -hmm. energy loss, you don't always know that's what's happening in your life. And that's why you feel so crummy. Right. And what I like to call it is waiting, like we, we're waiting for the hot flash to occur. But typically that's not some of the first things that you're, you'll you see, because that's all that we see is a woman fanning herself because she's hot. Right. Because and that's all you hear about someone sweating. But typically a lot of time, you know, I read in a study that what you usually see first are some of the mental um, signs like you may have anxiety or depression that may increase, especially if you have a history of it. But even if you don't, some people can have new onset as well. So it's important to look at all the signs. Uh, for me, I believe it was some of the uh, mental things, but then it was also like heart palpitations. And I never would have thought that that was a sign or a symptom of uh, perimenopause, rather. Well, and just for you know the record, in case someone doesn't know, perimenopause just means around menopause. So it's that period before you are uh, into menopause. And menopause is when you have not had a cycle for at least 12 months and one day. So perimenopause is that time before when you start getting all the symptoms when your cycle starts acting differently. And it can last anywhere from four to 10 years. Four to 10 years. So that's a, Uh that we often hear menopause and we don't even stop to then talk about or think about the Mm -hmm. peri is where the like, the real stuff happens where your life is changing. 
Mm-hmm, and you have exactly. to adapt to it. So give us an idea of people are waiting, as we know, longer and longer to settle down and then think about having kids. Mm-hmm. So give us the age range that typically people would hit perimenopause. And what's the well, youngest that we well, find? Okay. Well, for per- the average, well, I won't say average age, but perimenopause can start anywhere from mid to late thirties, all the way up into 50. So everyone's different. Some people may start seeing signs and symptoms in their late thirties. And then some may not even have that sign of first sign of symptom until they're 50 years old. So it's just kind of a big range. And that's why it's really important to look at the signs and symptoms and to know your body and kind of see what's happening and if anything is changing. Um, so that's the, uh, the biggest thing is, um, um, that it can start then. So you got to think about it. Some people, you know, I think my last child, I believe I was 36. I think I was, could have been 37. But, um, you know, that was, that was mine. But people start to have signs and symptoms then. Now, it does not mean that you can't get pregnant. So a lot of people think, you know, well, my cycle is sporadic. I haven't had it in a couple of months. Well, you may not have it for nine months if you're not careful. <laughs> <laughs> Paramounting pause does not mean no pregnancy. <laughs> exactly. Right. Because if you're still having a cycle, then you're still releasing You're eggs, ovulating, which means yeah. You can still, right. It means you still can get pregnant. So people need to be you know, aware of that. Just because you're having signs and symptoms, you still can possibly get pregnant. But so yeah. For someone who say they hit 40 and they're mm-hmm. like, now I'm ready to have a baby. Okay. Well, you might start having these perimenopause symptoms, but you do mm-hmm. get pregnant. Then you could find yourself with a toddler in menopause uh-huh. <laughs> and talk about two <laughs> difficult times of life. Exactly. Let's, is, so let's talk a little bit more about handling the symptoms. Mm-hmm. So, and, and finding out where you are, I'm mean, not right. all doctors, but some might say, let's, let's test and see what mm-hmm. would you be sure. testing for? And mm-hmm. what might that look like? If you, if you feel like I'm not myself, maybe this is what I'm going through. What would you suggest women do and talk to their doctor about? Well, I would say at first, you know, talk to your OBGYN um, if you uh, if you can. If, and sometimes, to be honest, they don't always have the answers. Um, you have to think about it. They are delivering babies, which is already a very hard and intensive task that you need to make mm-hmm. sure that you're up to date on everything new with that. Correct. And all the signs and symptoms and things that may go that could happen with delivery of babies and taking care of women who are pregnant. So they may not be experts in menopause. So it's really up to you to find that person who is, you know, it could be a nurse, it could be a pharmacist, it could be a doctor who specializes in that type of medicine. Um, For instance, my doctor, she was an OBGYN. She delivered both of my kids. Um, However, recently she has changed. Uh, She she doesn't deliver babies anymore. She's gone into more of the um, aging, I guess, uh, population uh, and menopausal women because her population has gone that way. Everyone's had mm. babies now. And she's so now moved with their clients. Yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I think that's really smart to do because, mm. you know, now we're coming to her like, I'm hot, I'm having heart palpitations and mm-hmm. I don't know what to do. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. so she has to learn about that. Um, but so it's just important to ask, you know, ask questions if they can't give you the answer or they don't know, or if they don't want to take the time mm-hmm. to learn, then it may be time to ask around it for, you know, for new um, recommendations or a new, uh, a second opinion or rather uh, would be very important. I love it that you say that because as a reporter and for many years of my news career, I covered health news and I always would stop and think. And now in this second stage of my life, I tell people like, if you don't feel like you're not, if you don't feel like you're getting the answers, don't stop and stay with that same or don't stay with that same person. Get exactly. the answers. Exactly. Um, I mm-hmm. see a um, an integrative health specialist and a doctor now where they, mm-hmm. they look at natural mm-hmm. things. They they look at the drugs. But my general care integrative doctor uh, mm-hmm. does tests yep. to yep. blood tests to see all these different things. And they've, they've been mm-hmm. able to tell me you're not quite there. You're still mm-hmm. here, but things are changing. Yep. And it's so good to have that information. Knowledge is power, right? Mm-hmm. It when is. we actually and, know. And that I'm glad you you know mentioned that because you did ask me about um, what can you do? So you mm-hmm. can do testing um, or you can just look at your signs and symptoms too. So most people can be diagnosed just by the signs and symptoms. And there are so many, some people may just have a hot flash. Some people may have hot flashes and night sweats. And then some people have the gambit of things where they have hot flashes, night sweats, anxiety, OCD. They may uh, they may uh, have itchy, dry skin. Their hair may be getting thin. I mean, it's just it's a bunch of different things. So everyone's different. And um, usually, typically, actually, I have a, a 
a checklist on my website that's free that can kind of help you go through some of those signs and symptoms. You can check them off and take that information with you to your healthcare provider to kind of talk to them about it. But usually they can diagnose you by the signs and symptoms. And especially if your cycle is acting wacky or weird. So it could be short. It could be a lot heavier. It could be skipping. It could be getting closer together. So it's any cycle changes is typically when your hormones are doing a little bit different thing. However, you can get a hormone panel done where they look at your different, you know, if it's your uh, estrogen, your testosterone, they, and your uh, progesterone, they look at all those things to see kind of where you are. The issue with that um, is that your hormones fluctuate during perimenopause. Mm. So one month you may go, one week you may go and they're high, the next week you may go, they may be lower. So that's why some people say that it's just not necessary to get panel testing. And I actually, I will say I did, you know, I got testing for myself. So, you know, I wanted to know, but a lot of times they can just tell by your signs and symptoms too. So what can someone do if they're, you know, they think they are in perimenopause, the beginning mm -hmm. stages, they feel mm -hmm. like crap. They're, you know, again, like one of the first things you hear women complain about is I'm gaining weight and I haven't doing it. I'm not doing anything different. I'm working right. out and I can't drop these, th those frustrating things. Is mm -hmm. there anything they can do on their own in these beginning stages to try to just feel better? Are there some vitamins they can take? You're the pharmacist. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> work out more. Like that's the frustrating thing for me. Yeah. It's like, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm doing everything the same, but things are changing and right. working out's and really yeah. not making a difference. And so you just want to so do something. You do. But the thing is, you, have, you know, we can't do everything the same. So it may be a diff because it doesn't work like it used to. Our bodies don't work like they used to mm -hmm. we don't digest foods the same way that we used to. There may be certain foods that you may need to adjust or, add, you know, take out or add into your diet. Right. So you, you need to really think about that as well. So for me personally, and I will talk about vitamins as well that I personally take. Um, but there are some things that um, you can do as far as naturally with your with your food, whether it's adding in uh, foods that, that are high, uh, that are phytoestrogen, which means they are higher in uh, they act like estrogen in the body, which are your uh, soy, your uh, flax seed, your um, edamame, uh, sesame seed as well. So oh. those types of things are actually phytoestrogens and they act like estrogen in the body. But of course, I always say everyone's health history is different. So make sure you talk to your healthcare provider before you yeah. add <laughs> these things as well. So yeah. you can do those types of things or you may want to change. Uh, the type of exercising that you're doing or how frequently you do it. I'm not saying that you need to exercise all day, but you just need to realize, okay, I'm doing, you know, are you doing things like strength training, right? Mm -hmm. I think strength training and building your muscle is always important because that helps as well. And then oh, what types of food are you, what foods are affecting you differently? So keep a mm -hmm. food journal and food diary and see, like for instance, things like spicy foods, caffeine and sugars, they all will increase they can increase your hot flashes. So, mm. and, and alcohol. So all the great things, hot food, yeah. alcohol, <laughs> sugar, all, all of those things, they actually will increase it. So you need to just, you know, I'm not saying don't do, eat them or don't drink them, but you need to be mindful that, okay, I had a one, glass of wine or two tonight. I just need to be prepared that I could possibly have a night sweat tonight. So they increase night sweats and hot flashes. Um, so you just need to be kind of aware of that. And um, that will actually... Um, just kept you be mindful of what you're doing. Right. Yeah. Besides that, um, I think, that, you know, some important vitamins that I actually take, of course, I take, you know, iron and a multivitamin that just helps with overall health and wellness for me. And I just do iron because when I was uh, my cycle was so heavy when I first started with perimenopause that that really people don't understand the importance of iron and how important it is for your heart health mm -hmm. and your hair, your skin, like all those things is really important for your red blood cells. Right. So that's important to me. And then also um, uh, vitamin D, uh, which is important for your mental health too. Mm -hmm. Magnesium, which has diff various um, uh, various causes, which can help you with sleep. It can also help with your muscles um, and things of that nature. And also your digestive system, it can help with that as well. Uh, vitamin E is always good to have an antioxidant, of course. Um, and then also omega-3 oils. Those are really good too um, when it comes to lubing up the body inside and out. Because, of course, we know some of those things you dry out everywhere, you know, when you're in perimenopause and menopause. So that really helps to lubricate with your joints and everything else. Yeah. Um, it's so important. And then also with your heart health too. So those are just some of the basic ones that I, uh, that I would, you know, mention when it comes to just a few basics. little things. You just mentioned mm -hmm. it. If, if you can't remember all those things, we'll, we'll have some things in the show notes that, <laughs> that will help because that <laughs> just a few 
you because what I'm what I'm thinking as a busy mom mm -hmm. with you know two jobs. I got the podcast. I'm teaching mm -hmm. now. I got kids in different parts of the country. Like the hard thing is that this hits often when we're at our busiest. I mean, doesn't it always when it rains, it pours when we're at yeah. our busiest, we are chasing kids and we are, you know, we're not slowing down and yet mm -hmm. our bodies are slowing down and yep, we don't know true. why, man, I had what I think was a panic attack. I've never experienced that before. And yeah. it's anxiety. My heart's mm -hmm. racing. It's, and we start as women, we blame ourselves and mm -hmm. we go, what's wrong with me? Why am I doing this? When it's, you'd have to give yourself a break. Like this is your body. Yeah. And your body needs support, all those things right. you just mentioned. And if we don't put those things first, we're going to have a hard time dealing with the kids across the country and the job and all of those things. That's but true. Mm -hmm. It is when we are important to put yourself first too, right? I mean, I know, of course, we want to take care of our kids and they're going to be, you know, priority. And we're always making sure that they're always taken care of. We know their shot records. We know what they've taken, what they've done, what sport activity is coming up next month. We know all of that, but we don't take care of our health first and we don't take care of our own health and recognize things that are different. Then we really can't take care of them. So, you know, some people may say, well, you know, my kids are a priority. Yeah, but you, if you're not taking care of your health, is not a priority then you can't take care of your kids' health. So yeah. you need to make sure that you're also taking care of your, your own yeah. health as well. And I like to say, I'm really glad that you mentioned that, that what example are you setting for your kids mm -hmm. when they are older, if you're not doing those things for yourself? We're only teaching our kids to take care of everybody else and not ourselves, not to be selfish, exactly. mm -hmm. but to, if you know, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to say this because I need to do it myself. If you <laughs> know your kid's sports schedule, like you just said, you should know what's going on in your body. Exactly. You should exactly. know. You should know where your levels are. You should know and stop and say, "Wait a minute! I know everybody else's schedule, but I don't even know what's going on in my body." Like, exactly. compare those two things and be sure you're you're doing both equally. Exactly. Like even when you're taking them to get their their physicals or their you know their sports physicals or their uh, annual if they have vaccinations or whatever, we have their schedule on our phone written out. And even today, for example, for myself, I'm going on a trip. I need a certain vaccine. I don't have my shot record. Because I grew up in a whole nother state mm -hmm. and I was like, uh, I don't know if I've had, you know, this shot. Let me check in. How can I check and see? So like, well, we can give you a tither test to see if you've had this, you know, before. But like we need to be able to keep up with our own vaccines, too. What have you taken? What are you up for? What not just your vaccines, but also your your annuals. Are you going to the doctor yeah. when you're supposed to and getting your your checkups? And so yeah. speaking of vaccines, there is uh, the CDC. They have certain vaccines that they recommend for people of a certain age. And so they just put the hepatitis B vaccine on the list. So if you are between um, the ages of 19 and 59, they recommend that you actually get a new hepatitis B vaccine. Because it Tell was me required. about that. Tell me why mm -hmm. and what we would face if we got hepatitis B, why we need that. Exactly. That's not something that I grew up thinking or knowing or even that my doctor here in Colorado has told me I need. Right. So with hepatitis B, it is a viral infection that attacks the liver. And there's about 2.5 million people in the United States that actually has it. And it's not curable. It's only preventable by getting the vaccine. And so CDC has recommended that if you're between ages of 19, 15, 19 mm -hmm. and 59, that you get this. And the reason being is because all of our kids already have it because the rule was set in 1991 that if you're when you're born, you have to get it when you're born. But anyone before that, it was not required for you to get it. So, so it's on the list that our it. kids would have to go to school, college, yes, all of that. Exactly. But you and I fall into the generation where we didn't need that when we were mm -hmm. young. Hmm. Yes, exactly. You didn't need it young or if you did get it, it may be time for you to get it again. Exactly. Hmm. You know, during that time as well. So, yeah. but typically if you've had, a, if you've had an update on your hepatitis B vaccine, you would know it. But most of us either have not had it or we had it when we were very, very, very young. How, how very is young. it contracted? Uh, it's contracted through body fluids, uh, typically through body fluids. So it's just important to be able to um, um, just protect yourself, right? When it yeah. comes to hepatitis B in general. So, you know, people say, well, you know, I protect myself or your kids, they have the vaccine too, right? So if, if it's important for them to have that vaccine, that vaccine at that age, it's important for us to as well. Yeah. So anyone before, born, born before 1991 may be uh, being unprotected from okay, hepatitis good. B. So really it's important good, to have. Good information. And I think, 
Mm-hmm. Thank you. And I think um, another very important thing to remember is that it is 100 times more infectious than HIV. So a lot of wow. people, you know, we hear about HIV all the time, but we don't mm-hmm. really talk about hepatitis B. Yeah. And why? Because it could cause you to have to have a liver transplant, may have liver failure. All of those things could possibly happen if you're not uh, if you do contract it, if you weren't protected from it. So it's really important to have. Well, good reminder but, overall on vaccines, as yeah, you mentioned, you. and 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 the bigger the bigger picture of find out what you've had, find out mm-hmm. what you need, see your doctor. Your but let's mm-hmm. let's talk, we talked about perimenopause. So once you mm-hmm. go through the couple of years of that, that's the really yucky. Do, do things like start then to level out? Do you get then, you know, to that next stage? You're like, okay, the hot flash has stopped and now I just don't have a period or, or does it well, continue some people forever? Do. Some people do, but the thing is some people have it uh, some people will level out, but then I know people who are seventies and eighties who still have hot flashes. So everyone is different. Mm-hmm. You know, some people may decide, you know, to supplement with a uh, hormone replacement therapy and some people may not, but there are, there is, it's just like when your body gets used to a certain thing, like you're used to a certain temperature or used to be in a certain way, it can level out, but you don't really know how long it's going to take or when it's going to be. Man, But, um, you know, people fail to realize that estrogen is actually protective for your body. So there are people who have, may have had hysterectomies you know, in their 30s and 40s and they didn't get on estrogen. Estrogen actually protects you because it's cardioprotective. It protects you from uh, diseases like obesity and heart disease because the receptors are all over the body. So that's why yeah. you see so many different side effects uh, or side effects, not side effects, but symptoms mm-hmm. of perimenopause when your estrogen starts to go down because they're all over the body and people don't really realize that. So are there, I know there are different forms and I think for people who think like I did for so long. This is when you get old. I'm not going to have to deal with this. But right. are there different ways we can deal with this? Like I hear people talk about the pellets that they have put mm-hmm. under their arm or the, the mm-hmm. pills, the natural versus the not natural. Like mm-hmm. what's most popular and what would you tell, where would you tell people to start? Well, I think for most people, um, well, to be honest, what's most popular for most people is not to do anything because people are so afraid to take hormone replacement therapies. Mm. But it's, I think it's up to the individual to decide what's best for for them because there were so many studies in the day that did not, first of all, they were using synthetic hormones. They were Mm -hmm. using older adults who were probably over the age of 60, I believe, or 65. So um, that's when they started them. So it's typically good to have it like after uh, within the first 10 years after your cycle has ended. That's that's optimal age. But they're actually now have hormones that actually look and act just like the, the hormones that are in your body. And those are you can, they're cheaper. You can get the prescription from your doctor. And you can get those as well. Um, so that is you know one way to look at it. But most people won't, you know, won't do anything and they'll just deal and suffer with it because they're afraid or if they're mm-hmm. not just because they're afraid, they're not also not educated about it because mm-hmm. their doctor don't know about it. Their mom didn't do it. So she didn't tell them about it. Mm-hmm. So they're mm-hmm. just not educated about it. So I tell everyone just to look and talk to your healthcare provider about your different options, what you can do, because there are natural things that you can do, too. There mm-hmm. are some uh, supplements and things that you can take, herbs and herbs and things that you can take as well um, that are natural. But I would say that um, if you want to look at HRT or if you want to look at the natural way, just look and uh, talk to your doctor about what's what's best for your history of your, you know, your medical history, I think is what's what's important. But once again, it's diving into those things. It's not mm-hmm. guessing. It's yes. it's taking the time, get your blood work, whatever mm-hmm. it is. Yes. I just did. I, I did this like six months ago and it mm-hmm. was fascinating to finally see like, well, no wonder I'm starting to yep. feel so tired in the middle of yep. the day and caffeine doesn't same work thing. anymore. You know, yep, same thing. Yeah. By the time I even found out with some of mine, I was already like pretty much into almost into menopause when I, when wow. I found out. So I went through all this, I had already gone through perimenopause and that's really what made me start to look into it. You know, we learn about it in school, but it's not enough time spent on it. So really it's yeah. up to the healthcare professionals to take their own personal time to go and learn more about it. Um, hopefully they'll start doing a little bit more in school, hopefully, since I think there's a lot more talk about it. Yeah. But typically you have to do your own research. And that's what happened to me when I started seeing that, oh, this possibly could be what it is. If I didn't know about it as a healthcare professional, there's no way that you know, other people who Absolutely. did not have this background yeah. know about it as well. Yeah. yeah. And I want to clarify when I joke about like, that's for people who are old. <laughs> we're living longer. We're, we're not. We are. We are like well, in the but, middle of our lives and we're going through this. Yeah. We are, but I think that people have, um, they've made it to where 
on the commercials and everything, like they don't look like us, right? They look older <clears> than us. And they are, they, those people probably are in menopause, but they forget about the people who are in perimenopause that look like yeah. you and I that yeah. are going through it. So we don't think it's us because we see someone chasing their grandchild around, you know, it's right. like, that's what we see on the commercials. Yeah. We don't see people that look like us. And, and yet you look at people. Menopause needs to change. I think so too. And you look at people who have little kids or like you, like Mm preteen teenagers, Mm -hmm. and that's the middle of life. You know, Mm -hmm. we're waiting, Mm -hmm. so many people waiting longer to have kids. They're going to go through all of this at once. But again, we're living longer as a, as a society. It Um, is. And I think, you know, the average age of menopause is actually between 49 and 51. So wow. menopause is 49 and 51. And people say, well, I'm, wow. I'm 55. I don't, well, that's that's why it's called an average. So between yeah. 49 and 51, that's just the average of people that typically, um, when they uh, typically have it. So we think so much older, but it's really not. It's really almost, you know, almost there. And people really need to recognize those signs and symptoms as well. And the more and we talk to, to about it and we understand and we don't feel an embarrassment about it or anything, mm-hmm. it's life. And we should right. be able to have these conversations that are comfortable mm-hmm. and learn from each other. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. But I, I do want to, um, you know, when I was talking about how much you go to the doctor and the things that you need to do, one thing that I can't be remiss, I know that we, you know, time is so valuable and time is our, mm-hmm. a lot of times we won't go to the doctor because of their time, right? Because they're so, you know, we're too busy. Time. <laughs> exactly. We're so, so busy. But for you to set up your your annual appointments and just have everything done at that time, mm-hmm. whether it's getting your, you know, your your mammogram or your uh, whatever you need to get um, done during that time, your blood work, your vaccines, those types of things. It's important just to have that set you know, schedule just for you. And especially yeah. with keeping up with your um, vaccine, as I mentioned you know, earlier with uh, yeah. Hep B and Hep Plus IV is really simple as far as when you are going to the doctor. It's only a two shot protocol, which means you can go, you know, have a shot and then you come back, you know, in a month or so and you get your next shot. So a lot of people think, well, I don't have time to go, but you really have to be able to keep up. And as far as uh, people want to know about side effects, a lot of times it's just like when you have um, any other shot or a side injection, you may see a little irritation there. You could possibly have a headache or fever, just like with any other vaccine. Um, So if people want to know more about Hepacyp, B, they can go to hepbcatchup.com because we need to catch up with our mm-hmm. kids because they're so already ahead of us. So we have to take yeah. care of myself as well too. Yeah. Okay. So for more information, people to follow you um, mm-hmm. and all that you're doing, uh, where can we tell them to go? You can, uh, if you want to follow more more about me or learn more about me, I'm more on all social media uh, platforms as Dr. Stephanie Yomo and that's Dr. Stephanie Yelmo, Y-O-M-O, or you can go to my website, drstephanieyelmo.com is where you can find me. And for more information on HEP with B, it is hepbcatchup.com. All right, Dr. Stephanie, thanks for your time today. Really good to talk to you. The best to you and your family. And we appreciate you educating us and, and helping us understand this topic for women. No problem. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for joining the Natalie Tisdall podcast. You can follow along on Instagram and at natalietisdall.com. Subscribe to the show to catch every new episode and leave a review so I can continue to bring you fresh content. See you next week.